Hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. My name is Edith and like last time, the Chattering Teacup is very busy helping our new personal assistants for our dear CEO learning the ropes. And when I say learning the ropes, I mean it, well, in every sense of the word, dear listeners. Anyway, I also have a guest with me this time, not just me. Thank goodness for that. You do not have to listen to me all the time. I have a lovely guest from across the pond, and here she is. Hello, Twyla, and welcome at Book Lover's Companion. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. And we are here to talk about your book, Piece by Piece. Is it correct to say that you are a biologist in, during the daytime and a fiction writer by nighttime? So it's semi-accurate. I used to be, I have now transitioned um, completely to fiction writing. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a biologist for a decade, over a decade. So I got a lot of that under my belt. <laughs> yeah, it seems so. Yes, yes, yes. Like I said, by day and by night. But now you are a fiction writer full time then. Yes. And uh, chaos coordinator for my house. You know, we have, I have two kids, a husband and three cats two dogs, some ducks, chickens, like we have a little mini farm. So I've got a lot going on. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. Indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. Uh, so when do you find the time to write the book? And or when did you find the time to write this book, Piece by Piece, which came out in May this year? Yes. Yes, in May. Um, oh, funny enough, actually, I started writing it um, using the Notes app on my phone. And, um, it was right after I had my son, my second child, I needed something for me, you know, cause I had left science and I was kind of lost. I didn't have anything that I could just call mine, you know? And, um, so I was like, well, what can I do? I have my phone. <laughs> That's pretty much all I have a phone and a baby. And so I got out my phone and I started writing and I had had a dream um, of one scene, and it actually ended up being chapter three of this book. And I started writing that on my dream and then went from there. And oh. after after I got to about 40,000 words, I was like, you know, maybe I should um, get Word or something on my phone <laughs> so that I can save this somehow, you know. And so, yeah, that's how I started writing. As trying to find that was my me time. <laughs> yeah, splendid, great, mm -hmm. wonderful. So, what can you tell us? What can you tell us about this book, about the plot, about a little bit about the character, without giving too much away? Of course. Yes. Um, so, in the book, we meet Arya Sutton, and we meet her on pretty much the worst day of her life. Um, she comes home from college and finds that she's been evicted. And it's all due to the actions of her drug addict mother. And um, she is out on the streets. But even worse, she's been taking care of her 12-year-old brother, Ben, all her life. And so she needs to find shelter for them because this is a rough neighborhood in Chicago, Illinois. And it's during a early fall cold snap. So they can't stay out on the street. That's not an option. And so she goes calling her friends and no one will help her. And then she reaches the name on her list. She really doesn't want to call. And it's Luke Harden, who was the literal boy next door when she was growing up. And he skipped town six years ago. And she hasn't seen him since. And they didn't exactly part on the best of terms. Um, but as fate would have it, he's the only one that will help them. And that sets the story in motion with Luke and Arya having to navigate a lot of stuff um, in a short time 
and how they handle that together. Mm, Not to give any spoilers. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, of course, of course not. But like you said, it starts quite harsh at the beginning. Yes. Very harsh for our main protagonist, Arya, and her brother. Her mother is, like you said, a drug addict, and they lose the apartment, and they have this creepy landlord. (laughs) Well, yeah, he's not a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Most certainly not. And there is no father uh, because her father. It is we can. I think we can uh, say that he committed suicide. Uh, yes. Yeah, he shot himself. Yeah, he's not in the picture. Yeah. Mm. And you said the book started, or the idea for the book started when you had a dream and it was your me time. So can you tell us a little bit more about this dream? So it actually was, um, my dream started actually with like the scene where Arya first gets to Luke's house. And it was really weird. I ha- It was a very vivid dream. It was like watching a movie and I could remember every detail. It was even how they looked and everything. It was just played out. And I saw her come to his house for the first time and how they interacted. There was a little bit of the backstory, you know, because they talked about why she was there. But I remember mostly it was the tension between them that really caught my attention. And I was like, you know, I really want to know the rest of the story. I woke up and I was so mad because I was like, I only got this one little snippet. Like, where's the rest of it? So I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to figure it out. You know? <laughs> like My brain wouldn't let it go. So I figured it out. I figured out the rest of the story. It's interesting that you said you woke up and you didn't know a the end of the story how did the story end it yeah. and you had to f- think it up for yourself but having such a vivid dream and such a it's let's call it plot for a story I, I wonder did the characters appear while writing sitting on your shoulder or whispering in your ear and saying oh yes I'm okay with that but oh you might want to change this part Yeah, so it's kind of funny because you feel a little bit, I don't know, schizophrenic, I guess, whenever you're writing a book because the people are real, you know, like whenever there's a a couple, couple times in the story that things didn't work out how I had originally thought, you know, I went back to look at my first outline, like rough Mm -hmm. outline that Mm -hmm. I had made. And I'm like, yeah, well, that didn't happen. And that didn't happen. And I went back and added this. And yeah, they have a mind of their own. They really do. They they become their own person. And anytime something happens to them, you know, it's like, okay, well, how would they react? Not how I would I react, you know, how would they react to it? And yeah, it's it's funny because it's like I know these people. <laughs> They're fake, but I know them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do know what you mean. And it's sometimes uh, for people who do not write or haven't ever tried it, sometimes they don't get it. But I do know what you mean. And also the fact when you said it seemed so real, like watching a movie, you know? Yeah. And do you also have this when you write, you need to see, see, you know, the scenes or the scene in your head, like a movie, before you feel it's ready to put on paper? Yeah, I usually do envision um, before I write. You know, it's like I sit there with my hands on the keyboard, but sometimes I have to close my eyes and then I'm like, okay, how is this actually going to play out? What, you know, what does it look like around them to really be able to set the scene? Yeah. And, yeah, that is, I like having the movie playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do I do know what you mean. And would you say then that you can plan for the story? Did you plan for this story then when you started writing down your ideas or what you saw in your dream? Um, 
I'm not really, it's kind of funny in my writing. I'm not really a strict planner. Um, I know there's people that have boards with, you know, post-it notes and yeah. everything. I, I can't do that because it changes too much. And it, it to me, having everything planned out almost adds to the chaos because when one thing changes, now I have to redo the whole back end of the board. And so I'm, I call myself a planter. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a pantser, but I'm also a plotter. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird combination. Like I have the story and I'll do, you know, when I say outline, it's not paragraph by paragraph. It's like, okay, one or two sentences of, I think this will happen in this chapter, but mm-hmm. we'll see, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll see if they actually do what I tell them to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, I also found it interesting that you said you, you completely knew how they looked like. And yeah. what what about the other characters? I mean, we're talking here about Arya and Luke. Also, yeah. Ben, did you also know what Ben looked like? No, he he was like kind of off to the sidelines mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. whenever I had my dream. I really just saw Luke and Arya and then everybody else, I kind of filled in the blanks. <laughs> okay. And where did you draw your inspiration for the other characters from? Where where did they come from? Well, unfortunately, um some of them came from people that I know in real life. Mm. Um loosely based, mm-hmm. obviously, don't want to get in any trouble. Yeah. Um <laughs> but it's acquaintances, not direct family members. Um but like I I know some acquaintances that have gone the path. I, I knew someone who was like Tasha, Aria's mom. Mm-hmm. And it's heartbreaking to see it in real life. And But I think it's something that a lot of people kind of gloss over. You know, it's ugly, it's gritty. People don't want to pay attention to that. They just want to yeah. kind of shove it off to the side and pretend it's not there. And Here where I live in Southeast Missouri, um, there's a pretty prominent drug problem um, Mm. just in general, which I think, Mm. you know, there's drug problems everywhere in the world. But there's a lot of I've seen a lot of people have that downslide and it takes a lot for someone to not follow that path. If that's something that's been in their family Mm. Mm. and that's I kind of got inspired by you know overcoming it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And when we say drugs, the listeners, we don't only mean the hard drugs because that's what Tasha is uh, addicted to. But there are different kinds of drugs which are socially accepted, aren't there? Because Luke's mm-hmm. past isn't a ro- a rosy one either, is it? Yes, exactly. He is. He has demons from his past that he's overcome and he wants to stay you know sober and um yeah that one it's definitely socially acceptable you know there's a whole culture and even like being a mom you know it's assumed a lot of the times that i drink wine after the kids go to bed you know every single night and (laughs) i i actually don't drink alcohol um But, you know, and it's fine if you do, but responsibly, you know. Yes. And a lot of the mom culture, it's like, oh, well, you drink coffee up until lunchtime and then you switch to wine and that's all you drink, you know, the rest of the day. (laughs) There's a lot of people joke about that. And I hope it's not the, you know, the case. (laughs) Um, uh, Okay. Uh, uh, Rewind here a little bit. So when you're a mother... (laughs) You are supposed to drink coffee until lunchtime and then you switch over to wine. That's not the idea or the picture I have in my mind about the United States, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it, that's the extreme uh, version and some people joke about that. And like I said, I hope it's a joke, you know, that's taking it to the extreme. Um, but I know that Like you said, you know, it's socially acceptable. Alcohol is. And a lot of times 
people's issues with alcohol get overlooked. Um, Mm -hmm. I have some family members that honestly probably need some help, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's just alcohol. So, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's just like, it's fine. You know, they just, they like to party. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you can like to party. And like you said, you drink wine every day, uh, then you might have a problem. Yeah, if you need it to function, yeah. that's yes. that's when it becomes a problem, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong, we in Europe do drink alcohol even for breakfast, you know, Prosecco. Yeah. You can always have a Prosecco for breakfast, nothing wrong with that. But that's it. I mean, one glass of Prosecco every now and again, okay, fine. But like we said, I usually drink… I'm drunk every day. <laughs> exactly. I drink water most of the time or coffee. Yeah. Or the teacup yeah. drinks tea and, you know, you do not yeah. need alcohol or I do not need alcohol to function. So, yeah. And when I drive, I do not drink at all. So, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And I mean, uh, Aria is someone who takes on a lot of responsibility. Right from the start. I mean, at the beginning of the book, she's 23 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her brother is 12. Her mother is a drug addict and she shoulders all the responsibilities. Or had yeah. has shouldered them right from the start, hasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a lot for her. And I think that's one of her growth points in the movie or in the in the movie in my head uh, in the book <laughs> <laughs> to me it's the movie um but that's one of her growth points is learning that she doesn't have to do it all yeah all the time yeah you know yeah and i think that's something a uh, look more or less tries to tell her yeah you're not you're not alone anymore we can share i mean which is Maybe at the beginning for her a bit strange because that's what she had done, yeah. like you said, from the start and have someone else to help with that. And what they do also, she needs to keep her brother with her. And it's also not the yeah. done deal because I think it's what Ben said. Why? Why do you have to go to court to have guardianship? Because what is it what mom did? Nothing. You did yeah. all the things to make sure, but that's not how how the law sees it. And like Arya said, it's by default her right. Yep. And there, I've seen a lot of situations where the parent shouldn't be the default. You know, um, actually, the person that I loosely um, was inspired for Tasha, Arya's mom, in the story. The person in real life that I know, they shouldn't have been mm. a parent, mm. you know, and um, they had they had several children and they shouldn't have had any. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of a flaw in the system. Um, and I know they have that. So people can't just take children. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you have to have some protections yeah. there. But. I think with. With the way Tasha is, it should be a no-brainer that mm-hmm. if someone else wants to do a better job, they should mm-hmm. be able to. And um, that's a really, yeah, I think that's a big flaw in the system. It should be some loophole. There should be some way around it. Mm-hmm. Also, the question of, we spoke about it a little bit, Luke's past, where <clears throat> he feels the need to turn around, otherwise he falls into the same trap as his father and he doesn't want to become his father. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that's also very hard for someone who hasn't seen anything else. You have to do it by yourself. There is no help from anyone else, is there? No, and it's really hard to like take control of something like that and like you don't know what you don't know you know Mm -hmm. and so it's it's insanely hard for someone who doesn't know a different lifestyle to make the choice to be different 
because they don't even know what that looks like. So it took a, in a crazy amount of strength for him to be able to do that and make that choice. But yeah, I don't think he gives himself enough credit for the strength that he has and being able to break the chains of addiction and move past that and become successful the way he did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he seemed to me in the book like the rock. Yeah. The, uh, how shall I put it? Not not just a safe place for uh, Arya and Ben, but also sometimes someone who brings a lot of calm into their troubled lives. Yeah, and I think that was really important for Arya because she has never had that. She's never had anyone that she could trust. Mm. You know, she's never had anyone that she could depend on. And so at first, she doesn't trust Luke. You know, she yeah. it's too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. And, so, you know, uh, it, it, there's not been any good in her life. So if something looks good, then it's a trap. It's a trick of some sort. Absolutely. And so she doesn't trust it at all at first and she really has to break down those barriers that she has and learn that you know she can trust someone else and um not everyone obviously but you know she can actually trust luke and that's a big hurdle for them to overcome mm -hmm. was there ever a moment when you wrote this book that you felt you have put too much on your uh, character's shoulders? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, I went back and added some happy scenes because there were quite a few times where I was like, gosh, like it's just one thing after the other and just, you know, negative and negative. Like I need to go in and add some happy because like, This is just too much. <laughs> And uh, during this during uh, this writing process, um, when when you when you were working on it, uh, did you ever feel okay? I have to stop, let it rest, and then come back to the story because I wrote myself into this corner and I couldn't get out did that ever happen to you or uh, never yeah i think that happens a couple times like um because i've written some other books too and each time sometimes it's like okay i've just i've been staring at the computer too long you know i gotta go and do something else and actually with piece by piece um the ending is completely different um I added it during editing mm. and I, I wanted, I wanted a, a happier <laughs> end to the book. And uh, I mean, it always had a happily ever after because that's the name of the game in romance. Mm -hmm. You have to have a happily ever after or people mm -hmm. will come after you with pitchforks. <laughs> But um, <laughs> I wanted it to be I don't know. I changed it a lot. Like the last three chapters I added during editing process because mm -hmm. it just, it wasn't right. And mm -hmm. it was one of those times where I was so thankful for the editor that I had because there were a couple times where I was like, okay, you know, this, I know this scene needs to happen, but I don't know how to get from here to here. You know, I don't know how to get from point A to point B because there's there's something missing. And then, you know, she would read through it and she'd be like, well, I think you need to explain this because in my head, the whole story is there. And so sometimes the disconnect in the book was the stories in my head. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I know the blanks. I, I mm -hmm. can fill in the blanks because I know the characters, but the reader couldn't. And she would point that out like, mm. well, you know, I don't mm. understand this. I'm like, oh, I thought I would put that in there. But I guess it just stayed up here instead. <laughs> yep. So yeah, there, there are a couple times where um, I could write something. And I mean, there's times I've deleted 
whole chapters. I have a whole file of everything that I've deleted from the book because I'd write it and then it'd be like, ah, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. It's I like it, but I don't know if it fits the story, you know. Yeah. So maybe I'll do some deleted scenes later on as like teasers or newsletter sign up things. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're switching perspective in in your book chapter wise. I mean, you have chapter Aria and you have chapters uh, Luke. Did you yeah. ever think of or did you play with the idea of using first person narration for those perspectives or never? Did it never come up as an idea? To me, writing, um, I gravitate towards third person. Mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't ever written in first person, mm -hmm. and it feels awkward for me. I'm not saying I'll never write in first person, but I definitely am a lot more comfortable writing in third person. Mm -hmm. I don't mind reading either. Um, like I've read plenty of first person, and mm -hmm. I don't know. For me, it's just. I guess I grew up reading third person, mm -hmm. you know, and because I feel like first person, at least in the books I read, it's a relatively new um, kind of, I don't know, popularity. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't used to be super popular. And so I'm just used to, like, that's how my brain thinks <laughs> is in third person when it comes to books. Do you think it has also to do with the fact that you saw it? Saw it, <laughs> like probably, like a yeah, movie? yeah. I feel like I'm a cameraman or something, you know. So, yeah, it's it probably definitely has to do with that. Hmm. And you published the book with a small press. Did I get this right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And did you try bigger presses as well, or did you think of self publishing it? What yeah, can you tell so, us about that? So this is actually the second book um, that I've written and tried to publish. And I will say I learned a lot between the first book and this one. Um, so a lot of the problems with the first one was probably me <laughs> you know, being a novice and, again, not knowing what I didn't know. and. Um, With that one, I sent it out with the first one. I sent it out to like everybody. You know, I sent it out to agents. I sent it out to small presses. And I don't know, the process is daunting for sure, especially querying agents and all of that. And with piece by piece, I was much more selective, I guess you could say. Um, I didn't just send it out on blast, you know, to, a hundred people or whatever I went through and I, I took my time. Uh, the first one, I didn't take my time. I was very anxious. Yeah. You know, I was eager. And so I just sent it out. I sent it out before it was ready and I didn't put as much thought into who I was sending it to. Um, But with this one, I did. And I did consider self-publishing at one point because I was tired of waiting. But I also made myself pause because that's how I got in trouble with the first book. You know, I can't be impatient. <laughs> and with publishing, you know, it's a lot of waiting. You got to get used to that. <laughs> so um, I'm still working on that. Um, but yeah, I... I actually found my publisher because I'd read a book that they had published. Um, it's called Nowhere Near Goodbye by Barbara Conray. And I loved it. I absolutely loved that book. And I had developed a habit of anytime I loved a book, I was like, okay, who published it? And can I publish with them? And so that's how I found uh, Red Adept Publishing. And I contacted. Barbara and she was so nice like she didn't brush me off you know or anything as a crazy wannabe writer um but she actually was honest about 
the company and how she liked working with them. And I chatted with her a lot and I was like, you know, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to submit to them. And lo and behold, it, it worked It was like serendipitous. You know, I just happened to read her book and find the publisher that was going to make my dreams come true. So. <laughs> hmm. Fascinating. You said you chatted with the author you uh, found who published with the yeah. company. And that, of course, brings me to another question. How important has the writing community become to you? Oh, very important. Like, this is a very solo endeavor. You know, you're other than your characters, you're just in a room, you know, by yourself or with your cats or whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> you're just writing and a lot of the editing, you know, is virtual and um, you might talk on the phone, but a lot of it's email. So you can feel really disconnected yeah. from the outside world whenever yeah. you're doing this. And so it's really nice to be able to talk to other authors and it's really nice to be able to get advice, you know, from someone who has been there, done that. Mm -hmm. And so we're not all re reinventing the wheel every time. And, you know, it's, I, I really cherish having a community mm. and my publisher actually has a big Facebook group for all the authors that they have. And so we can, you know, if someone gets an award, then everybody cheers them on and everybody's supposed to share each other's new releases and cover reveals. And it's really helpful, especially as a newbie. Mm. And how does it differ writing oh, the community and the whole process of writing fiction from being in academia? Oh, <laughs> it's like night and day. Um, <laughs> like writing, because I have some, you know, scientific research papers that I've published, and those were not fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it was nice having, you know, my name on a published paper, and it was nice getting my work out into the world and feeling like, hey, maybe one day this little paper that I wrote yeah. is going to make a difference in someone's life, you know? Um, but I feel like that also applies to fiction. And I think that's one mm -hmm. reason why I kind of touch on the hard topics that a lot of people don't mm -hmm. want to touch on um, is because, you know, if someone can read my book and mm -hmm. it helps them through some of their struggles, then, you know, that's, That's the goal is, you know, to either make someone happy or make someone feel seen. Um, but yeah, the academic writing process, the editing is not nearly as um, stimulating, I guess. You know, it doesn't stimulate your creative brain. That's for sure. <laughs> it's, it's no, no creativity in it at all. Um, it's actually fun whenever you see someone who has a big name in science and they can get away with writing something that has some personality in it, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, like this is the most fun paper I've ever read because it's like a real person is writing it, you know, because otherwise everything has to be scientific, you know, it has to be like very straightforward. I mean, that's just the nature of it, you know, that's how it's supposed to be. But I did find while I was in science that like, I don't know, the creative part of me was withering away and <laughs> I, I didn't have time to read really, mm. you know, mm. fiction. Mm. Like I just had to read scientific papers all the yeah. time and it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, would e I would even be so bold and say that fiction might even have a bigger impact. Yeah, more people read it. <laughs> exactly, exactly, absolutely. And um, get names out there, get your name known by a lot of people. And I mean, what is wrong to entertain people? And it's nothing against yeah. academia, don't get me wrong. I love to oh, read exactly. a good book about science, about, I don't know, the latest findings or whatever. But also, 
I mean, um, let's say academia stimulates the brain and fiction might stimulate your feelings, also the yeah. thought process, because like I said, it's not just science that stimulates the brain, because when you have a book of fiction, it can also start a thinking process. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, definitely. Challenge your ideas, maybe sometimes in a better way or in an easier way than science does or academia does. Yeah, and it definitely, it can make you change your outlook on different things in life, you know, like, I, I don't know, there's a lot of things that I've read in fiction, and I'm like, you know, I've never really thought of it that, that way before, mm -hmm. you know, and then who knows, you can completely, like, change your outlook, like, with addicts, you know, like, maybe yeah. before you felt really harshly toward them, but yeah. then... Maybe whenever you read my book, you'll understand their struggles a little bit better or something, you know. Most, most you definitely. You see the world through someone else's eyes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And when you mentioned uh, at the beginning of our conversation that you know people who had struggled with mm -hmm. addiction and so on, I mean, probably everyone knows someone yeah. who has or had struggles with be it hard drugs or be it alcohol, like we said. And in our family, there were also, we also know people who had in the past struggled with it. And when, like you said, when you know about their situation and what made them turn to alcohol as a relief, mm -hmm. then, like you said, you, you understand them better. And when you can transport it via a good book, it's even yeah. better. Yeah. And like you said, people, yeah, more receptive may, may, to it. yeah, absolutely. And you might come to think, oh, like you said, I've never thought about it like that, but maybe, hmm, good point. Yeah. 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 And I actually, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to start writing was each time I, like with both of my children, I had postpartum depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and so I was in a really dark place and that was why I was like, I have to find something that I can call my own. It's just mine. No one can take it away from me. And because I felt like, you know, I didn't have control of my body. I didn't have mm. control of my sleep, my mm. eating, nothing. I had absolutely zero control. And that's part of yeah. the triggers for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think that's also why my characters go through so much. You know, they're in some dark places and part of it is because I was in a dark place and having them overcome the odds and pull through, it, it helped me do the same at the same time. And while I had postpartum depression, I read um, Down Came the Rain by Brooke Shields mm -hmm. and it's her memoir where she had postpartum depression and she was one of the first big names to really talk mm -hmm. about that kind of thing because mm -hmm. there's a lot of stigma behind that like you have mm -hmm. a newborn you're supposed to be happy you know and it's like well i love my baby but i just don't love anything else right now you know <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> that's that's it and so reading her book was a game changer for me because yeah. i felt seen you know i was like someone else Yeah. Like there's some of the pages I would take a picture with my phone and send it to my husband and be like, this, this is what I've been trying to say. And I couldn't find the words to say it. You yeah. know, this is like, she makes sense of it. And so I think I, I didn't set out to include mental health struggles mm -hmm. in my books. You know, I set out to write a Hallmark <laughs> style story, you know, but it just didn't happen. <laughs> like, and um, I, I kind of, I, don't know, I kind of like it that way. Um, not saying I won't write a Hallmark because I have some plants on the board behind ooh. my computer. You know, ooh. yeah, ooh. I, I have ooh. lots of plants. <laughs> um, That's good to know. But the next, the next book in this series also deals with some mental health because. Mm. In the book, we meet Chrissy. I won't say who she is because that's kind of a spoiler. 
Um, but in piece by piece, we meet Chrissy and um, book two is her story mm. and her happily ever after. Uh-huh. But through to get to her happily ever after, she has a lot of baggage to deal with. Yep. And she has a lot of mental health struggles to mm. overcome mm. and to open up about. So there's more of that. I do think her book is a little happier. There's a little less um, bad things thrown her way, but <laughs> she's had them in the past. Yo. So <laughs> <laughs> she's had a lot of bad things already. So I was like, okay, girl, you can rest. <laughs> okay. Huh. Okay. Okay. Uh- we we we've mentioned this lazy uh, landlord. Is there anything you would never touch upon in your writing? You would never mention in your writing. Um, let's see. I probably wouldn't mention like really like a, a harm coming to children. Like mm-hmm. I know Ben gets put in situations um, in piece by piece. But mm-hmm. he doesn't actually like get hurt, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, everything is stopped in the nick of time. Um, but I don't think I could go there, especially mm-hmm. after becoming a mom. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my intrusive thoughts, whenever I had um, really bad PPD, had to do with like harm, you know, coming to my children. Yep. And like I, I can't. Like that's a line I can't cross. I can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> can't never harm the dog, dear listeners. We've spoken oh, yes, about it yeah. quite often. Never do that. Yeah, or a cat. No animals, no children <laughs> yeah. being harmed in my books. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, Twyla, is there a genre you are writing uh, um, romantic uh, novels? Is there a genre you would absolutely love? To give a try. Um, well, I I have plans. Like, women's fiction doesn't really like vary too far from romance. You know, it just it focuses less on the romance and more on the woman's journey. But I have ideas for women's fiction. Um, and actually, back in high school, I started writing a historical romance. It's still romance, though, but. I don't know. There's a lot of uh, uh, eagle-eyed detectives that read <laughs> historical romance. They're like, no, you got that shirt wrong. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a little intimidating to me. <laughs> But I don't know. I've I have pen names picked out for several different genres. I, I think paranormal would be fun. Ooh, um, okay. Yeah, I did have a little snippet. Like, I have a lot of weird dreams. And so uh, <laughs> I jot them down because you never know. I, I had a dream about a vampire and I'm like, okay, you know, I could make that into a book. You know, like I could do some paranormal. I think that would be fun because you get to make up stuff, you know, like your own reality. I mean, all books are made up, obviously. But, <laughs> but you know, you there's no rules. In paranormal, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> exactly. I mean, as long as you are consistent, you can do whatever you like. And please don't make them sparkle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No sparkle, no glittery please, vampires. <laughs> please don't. Just. <laughs> uh, Twyla, uh, after your experience now of writing what you love to read, probably. What would be your advice to any other author? The main thing is never stop learning and don't give up. Because mm-hmm. a lot of things, like this book is four years old, piece by piece. It's four years old now because um, my son is four and a half. So <laughs> this book is four years old. I'll always know how old the book is. Um, and there are so many times that. I wanted to give up because it's not an easy process. And um, one of the things that helped me so much along the way is I never stopped learning. Um, I did a bunch of online conferences, even free ones. You don't even have to 
go in the hole um, financially to learn. You know, there's lots of free resources. There's YouTube channels. I've subscribed to, I don't even know how many. There's free online conferences. You might have to sign up for some email lists, but hey, the information's free. There's other authors. There's Facebook groups of other writers. And there's just so many places you can learn information. And of course, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. You can't just believe everything at face value. But, you know, I, like I said, I've written another book before this one, and I learned so much in between these two books. And I really think that well, I know that that's what helped me get this one published is this one's a lot better. <laughs> and it's because of what I learned. So, yeah, my biggest advice is always learn. You never know everything ever. You can't know everything. And things are always changing. Just like every other industry, publishing is changing. Trends change. Like the way things are done change with new technology. So you can't ever learn enough. Just learn everything you can. Soak it all up from any source. And you got to have tenacity. You got to stick with it. Hmm. I've been defrozen, it looks like. Sorry about that. <laughs> Camera, camera problems, that's technology yeah. and when it's hot in the city again. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with everything you said. And like you said, you can never or you should never stop learning, be it as a mm -hmm. writer or in any other field. It's important. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's where I think my PhD training came in handy because I was used to always learning and everything in science. Like there's yeah. new things every minute of every day. Yeah. And so I, I applied the same kind of like work ethic and techniques mm -hmm. to studying the publishing industry. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. You have touched a little bit on the plans of what's coming up. Can you yeah. elaborate a teeny tiny bit for us? Yeah. So I actually have several more books planned for this series. Um, And I have book two is currently in line for content edits. So that's exciting. It's getting close. It'll probably be <laughs> early next year um, whenever it comes out. I don't mm -hmm. have a date set mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. because um, one thing I love about my publisher is that we can set our own deadlines. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you can ask my editors. I give myself tight deadlines. Um, there were several times they were like, you know, you can take a minute. Like, you don't have to turn this in like the next day. Right. And I'm like, no, but my brain says I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so hopefully book two is early next year. Um, that's probably like given the time frame for, you know, edits and waiting in line for line edits and all that. Um, and soon once, things kind of die down in my life a little bit. My life's been chaotic this summer. <laughs> um, I'm going to do final self edits for book three mm -hmm. and get that turned in. Um, so it can get in line for edit yeah. two. Yeah. So hopefully the time between books decreases. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, cause I know a lot of people are like, okay, when's book two coming out? And I'm like, I'm working on it, but <laughs> yeah, I have, um, the next book is titled, or right now, it might change, but um, it's titled Step by Step, and mm -hmm. it's Chrissy's story, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, mm -hmm. and it's a slow burn um, workplace romance, hmm. and um, yeah, and she, I will say, she does go into the art like she does at the end of, um, you know, one? towards yep. the end. Yeah, yeah. And so... So yeah, she, she does go down that path, but it's a workplace romance, slow burn. Like I said before, she deals with her mental health and we meet Adam is the male lead in um, her book. And he has his own skeletons in his closet that he needs to overcome. Of course, they got to have skeletons in the closet. 
and they got to overcome something, you know. <laughs> of course. Huh. And Absolutely. it's a second chance romance, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when can we read about the vampires? <laughs> um, I don't know. I actually have quite a bit of an outline on that one, but <laughs> that'll be another pen name. I'm going to, uh, I'll have to, I have a pen name picked out for that. Like if I do, uh, yeah, I, I, I got bored one time and I was like, okay, so my middle name is Annette. So if I write historical, I had thought about going with Annette Mason because Annette is kind of a historical feel to it, you know, like it's kind of an older name. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the, there's a lot of different pen names for all the genres. If I ever write a thriller, I tell you with my anxiety, I feel like I could write a good thriller, but I don't know if I want to. <laughs> hmm. Why not? It might help overcome said anxiety. It might, bit. yeah. Like, I can think of every worst case scenario ever in the world. So, yeah, you see, know. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, um, well, not why not? I mean, bring it on, bring it on. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I could be like James Patterson and write in every single genre. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Of course. <laughs> why not? Give it a try. <laughs> I'd say do yeah. it. Do it. Just get started. Yeah, and I do might. It. Yeah. Mm. And we would read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You have every right to be excited. Twyla, is there yeah. anything else you would like our listeners to know? Hmm. I don't know. Um, if they want to keep track of like when book two is coming out and everything. I'm most active on my Facebook and Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I have a newsletter they could sign up for as well. Mm -hmm. But um, also if you get a signed paperback, I always give a bookmark inside of it. So you can get a free bookmark there too. Um, but yeah, just, I am beyond grateful for everybody who's read my book you know it's it's surreal like it was nerve-wracking because it's something so personal you know yeah. like it came from me it is 100 like my imagination on those pages and no one prepared me for how vulnerable i was gonna feel Whenever it launched, like I knew I'd be excited because it's like, yay, I have my name on a book now, you know, like this is what I've thought of since I was in third grade, but I didn't realize how scary it was going to be. I mean, it's like walking naked out in public or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you feel completely exposed and everybody that's told me, you know, left reviews um, or told me how much they liked it. Like, it's just mind-blowing to me, you know, and it's slowly hammering down the imposter syndrome that I have, <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's like, okay, well, you know, this person's a stranger and they liked it. So they're not just lying to me, you know, no. just to make me happy. Like, it has to be real. Um, it is real. But yeah, <laughs> I, it's, Yeah, like I'm so thankful for everybody that's taken the time to read it, taken the time to review it, and like I hope you like book two just as much, you know. Like I hope I can keep it up. <laughs> yes, please do because I'm very much interested in Chris's story myself. Yeah, and everybody that has read book one, whenever they find out that book two is Chrissy's story, they're like, yay! Even my editor, I was, <laughs> she's like, oh, what what's book two about? And I was like, it's Chrissy's story. And she's like, oh, I've been wanting to know her story. So <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. hopefully everybody likes it, likes what I do with her. I really like her her journey. I like her growth. And she ends up in a much better place. Like mentally, that's good by to the know. End of book two. That's good yeah. to know. I think she also deserves it. 
she does. Yeah, she's been through a lot. So I, mm. uh, I'm really glad to see her get her happily ever after. That's why I was like, okay, now, I, like, as soon as I got done with this one, I was like, okay, I got to write her <laughs> something happy for her. <laughs> yeah, it's good to know, and I'm quite certain that all your other fans also look forward to it. Yeah, I've had some people like reach out and tell me like, okay, can I get like an advanced copy? And <laughs> that's cheating. Like, well, it's not edited yet. <laughs> yes, that's cheating for everybody else. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Twyla, it was absolutely lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for joining yeah, me. I had a good time. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Please don't go away. Uh, I will be with you shortly. Please wait in the green okay. room and I'll be back in a moment. All right. Thanks. Dear listeners, I am frozen again on the screen, but we do hope you enjoyed this episode as much as my guest and I did. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. And we will meet again at Book Lovers Companion. See you next time.